thanks for the introduction. Um, so this is uh, joint work with, well, depending on, on time, hopefully I'll be able to tell you about two different things. And, um, and this is all joint with Broder, uh, Andre Broder, uh, Yevgeny Kabrilovich, which I think was, he was here recently, relatively recently. Um, Dan Golsi, Bo Ping, and, and Duncan Watts. And I think Bo was also here maybe not too long ago. Um, so uh, before jumping into the, the, the actual a, a couple substantive problems, I want to give you an overview of, of this uh, new area of computational social science, um, which I've been working in a lot recently. Um, so social science research has traditionally been, been based on a few different uh, types of data collection methods. Um, here are, are the most common methods, self-reported data, including surveys and polls, laboratory experiments, and uh, so-called data-free methods, simulation, theoretical models, and rhetoric. And, and I don't mean this in any sort of derogatory way that these, these really are uh, you know, legitimate ways of, of investigation and they have uh, led to um, um, insight in the social sciences. Uh, but all three of these, uh, these methods, you know, while, they've, while they've certainly been fruitful, they, they have a few uh, fundamental limitations. Um, for example, surveys are much better suited for measuring attitudes rather than actions. You know, if I, if I give you a survey and ask you, um, you know, just you know, what do you think about issue X, you can you know, give me a reasonable answer to that. But even if I ask you a relatively basic question about your behavior, that's difficult. You know, if I ask you, what did you eat for lunch last Tuesday? You know, it's, you know, relatively simple question, but it's, it's extremely hard to get an accurate response to something like that. And now if I ask you anything even remotely complicated, you know, how much, what percentage of your time do you spend on this website or, you know, or, or what would you do in this situation? And that's extremely hard to elicit from an individual. And so in this sense, surveys are, are, are good at measuring attitudes, but they're, it's, it's difficult to leverage surveys to, to measure actions. Um, laboratory problems are very good for isolating uh, in, uh, reactions to individual um, uh, uh, an individual stimulus, uh, but in the real world, we're, we're subjected to a variety of stimuli, and in, in understanding the interactions between all these stimuli is is quite difficult. And so you have these these problems of external validity that in a laboratory you can determine this you know, this stimulus has this effect, but now in the wild, what you know, w what is the actual effect when we're when we're deal dealing with a variety of, of other uh, of other factors? Um, and uh, finally, um, and this is something that I'm, I'm particularly interested in that that using conventional methods, it's it's quite difficult to study interacting individuals and group dynamics. So it's it's hard to um, you know fit 100 million people into a laboratory. Um, but you know now we do have these real world laboratories that where we can ask questions about about group dynamics. Um, so over the you know the, these these types of um, issues have come up in in other fields and in, and uh, over the last twenty or thirty years, large scale data analysis has been the answer to a lot of these uh, uh, these um, weaknesses of of other methods. And uh, biology and physics, just to name two disciplines, have been particularly successful of integrating that viewpoint um, into, into the usual everyday analysis. Uh, social scientists have only recently begun to adopt uh, this large-scale data analysis approach. Uh, but the benefits uh, that, as, as I'll try to show in this talk, are already apparent. And really, the, the high-level take-home point, and really, you know, if you, if you don't remember the the, the substance of, of the talk, which you likely won't in a, in a couple of months, the, you know, I, what I hope that you, that you will take away is that you know, we can now address, using this large-scale data ana analytic approach, we can now address problems in the social sciences that were largely thought to be intractable 10 years ago. And an even more extreme viewpoint is, is, is that we didn't even know that, is, it's not that we, we had these questions and in theory we thought they were answerable, but we didn't know how to answer them. It wasn't even clear that these types of questions made sense, that, you, you know, that they, they were even in theory measurable. And so it's, it's really changing the way that we, that we think about social science, or at least the way that I think about, about social science. So I'll, I'll try to again, be more concrete in the talk and give you a couple examples of the, that exemplify these points. Um, so now, in, uh, what are the uh, the reasons for this, um, for, for social science beginning to adopt uh, these new, um, uh, uh, this, this new way of, of approaching the, uh, the discipline. And I think there are really two, um, uh, two changes that have prompted this. The first is an explosion of data. 
Um, so for example, demographic data, such as age and gender, we pretty much have this on everybody. Now everyone who's online, at least, do we have it for. So that's a large fraction of the, uh, the population. Uh, behavioral data, again, we have for a lot of people. Um, you know, what you purchase online and offline, we, we generally have access to. Um, certainly what you browse. Um, uh, but but uh, any sort of online activity is relatively easy to, to measure. Um, and, and so this is widely available now. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, there's then a, a growth, a huge growth in, in, in network uh, data. So communication data like email, IM, and Facebook. So this lets us infer who your friends are, or at least who, the, who are the people that you're in contact with. Um, so uh, in addition to this, this um, growth in, in data, we, we have an explosion in computing power. Um, so MapReduce, Hadoop, Pig, I, this is you know, probably mostly Mo most of you are familiar with this, I, I imagine. Is that true? Roughly these types of, um, you know, m m I, uh, yeah, massively distributed um, uh, parallel computing platforms. These are they're relatively commonplace, and uh, they've really changed the way that we can um, uh, do analysis at a large scale. That you know, you, when you're talking about you know, computing over terabytes of data. Um, uh, hundreds of terabytes of data. You know, this is something that 10 years ago, you'd have to have a reasonably good understanding of parallel computation to just say, like, I'm not worried about that. Um, now you really don't need to know anything. You just kind of do it. And I'm, again, as I'll, I'll try to convince you in this talk, I really don't know anything about um, parallel computation, but the types of computation that I'm doing would have been considered very, very serious 10 years ago, and now they are essentially trivial. And so now social scientists um, like myself can use these types of tools to, to, to really um, uh, address problems that, that wouldn't have been reasonable a relatively short period of time ago. Um, and again, uh, d these are these are widespread, but they're also pretty expensive. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have to spend tens of millions of dollars to build these, these types of um, compute clusters. Uh, Amazon um, uh, has has really uh, uh, made it possible for uh, individuals without huge capital um, uh, 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 cash flow up, up front. They can they can use these things just on a pay per cycle, um, pay by use um, uh, um, accounting. And so the EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, is an example of this where you just pay for the computing power that you use. And so that really makes it um, reasonable for academics in particular to, to, to use these new tools without building your own um, um, cluster. OK, so now to the, the first part of the talk. Uh, it's, it's, this is an investigation of the structure of online diffusion networks. Uh, and so a question that's, that's um, a very traditional question in, in that's gone back, at least in the academic literature, um, about 100 years, is how do products and ideas diffuse through um, societies and cultures, right? And here I'm, I'm using this, this term product uh, very loosely, I mean, but you can, you can uh, just imagine any, uh, you know, any, I, any idea, it's, it's going from, it starts from one individual who had this idea, and it you know, potentially goes to their friends and their friends. You know, they spread it to their friends and just goes out. You know, it's similar to how um, a biological contagion would diffuse through a population. And this is the the prevailing model of of information diffusion. And here, this is this is real data. I won't say exactly what this is that we're looking at right now, but um, I'll, I'll come back to it later in the talk. But here, um, in this in this data set, the the product in question started at this at this node right here. And then the nodes are colored by um, generation, so it's a little bit hard to see. But it went to these three yellow nodes, and then it went to these purple nodes, and then it went out to the red nodes. And this is exponential growth. And then it was it was cut off. And so at some point after about um, seven, eight generations, the process was intentionally terminated. But otherwise, it would have you know presumably would have kept on growing in this fashion. Um, so this is, I, I'm throwing this up here as an example of, of what a lot of people have in mind when they, when they think of the diffusion of, of, of ideas or products. Okay, so now with that um, in mind, we really want that, that we want to measure what does diffusion actually look like in the real world, not in particular examples where, where we can, um, you know, where we pick them out usually because they're, they're popular and so it's relatively easy to collect data on them, but we we want to look just across a, a broad set of product and examine what is, you know, what is this diffusion structure look like. Um, 
so uh, this again, this is the, the, the data part of the of of the problem that that uh, ten years ago or even five years ago, this it was hard to come by this type of diffusion data. And why is that? Because for every ideally, what we want is very high resolution observations. So at the individual level, we want to say that this individual adopted this product, and then their contacts adopted this product and their contacts adopted. And we want to be able to, to observe each of these individual level or these, these, these pairwise interactions, right? So that's a fairly serious measurement question how, of how one goes about collecting that, that, um, uh, that type of data. Um, but uh, now we have a lot of examples of this. And so in this talk, I'll, I'll present six, six such domains um, in three of them these first three, we observe direct peer-to-peer -peer transmission of the product. And the way we do that is these are these first two at least um, are, uh, well, the, let me use the second, this second example, is the secretary game. It's, um, it's just an online game. And so people come to this page, and there's a specific URL associated with that page. But we, we make sure that URL, URL is unique to that individual. So every time somebody comes, we give them a unique URL. And so now if they copy and paste or forward this, this page by any other means, we can track back, back how that new individual came to the site. Okay, So we can figure out exactly what this diffusion structure is. Um, Yahoo Kindness works the same way. Um, it's, it was also this campaign to uh, uh, where you do something nice and then you try to get your friends to do something nice. Uh, again, there was the, the, the pay, it, it was just implemented as a web page. And so we gave everybody a unique URL and then we could track back the exact diffusion structure. Zinc, this is a video sharing application built into uh, Yahoo Messenger. Um, and so here we, uh, um, uh, we know who you shared the video with. And so then again, we know exactly how this thing is diffusing because part of using the product is declaring who you want to share it with. Uh, and then these other three examples, uh, we don't have direct observation of the transmissions, but we can infer the transmissions. Because what we do have is we have a network that underlines each of these products. So in this first case, we're looking at Twitter. Here we're looking at Facebook. And the, in this, the last one, we're looking at the uh, Yahoo IM network. And so we have this underlying network over which the diffusion is taking place. And then over this network, we have adoptions of particular products, and they're all timestamped. And so from these timestamped adoptions and from the underlying network structure, we can infer the diffusion pattern. So here there is this uh, inference question that you know, I can write down a variety, in theory, I can write down a variety of diffusion patterns that would lead to the same, um, same, uh, same observed adoptions. Uh, in fact, it doesn't matter in our case, and it'll become clear in a minute why why that's true. But for now, I'll leave it at the, that. Uh, I'll leave it at saying that that even in these indirect observation domains, we have a pretty high confidence that we can uh, infer the actual diffusion structure. So again, I'll, I'll come back to why that's the case in a minute. OK, so this is the data. So we have um, really very high resolution data on how uh, products, I'm going to refer to all these as products in a general sense throughout this talk, of how all these various products are, are diffusing over, the, um, uh, over a social network. And now there's the computation question. So how do you analyze 100 million diffusion events um, over a 1 billion edge network? So here the 100 million diffusion events, these are uh, URLs on Twitter. So each URL I consider a distinct product. And we're seeing how each of these, how each of these products diffuses over Twitter. And so this is um, a you know, pretty serious uh, question, right? This is um, uh, tens of terabytes of, of data. And, it's, uh, and now you have to do this fairly complicated computational question of actually reconstructing the diffusion tree. You certainly can't hold the network in memory. Um, uh, and so it's, you know, it's, it's not clear how you, would, how you would do this, at least 10 years ago. It, it would seem like it's a, it's a difficult problem. Um, well, it, MapReduce um, uh, turns out to be a very simple, simple way to do this. Um, so again, it, I, I'm assuming most people are, are familiar with this. So I'm not going to go into detail about what MapReduce is, but just in, in case you haven't seen this, um, 
uh, I'll, I'll say that the, the rough idea of split, apply, combine. Uh, so you take this master problem, you split it up into a bunch of different pieces. So here we're you know, distributing the, the products. We analyze these all, all separately. Then we do some local computation, and then we combine all the results uh, together. And uh, I come coming from a statistics background, and so this uh, is, is very similar to Hadley Wickham's supplier R package. I'm not sure if, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but it's it's exactly the the same uh, the same type of idea, and the core principles behind um, mass map reduce are move code to data. Local computation is much much better. It's it's hard to move around tens or hundreds of terabytes of data, but it's relatively easy to move code around and, and, and try to optimize for that. Um, the important to the end programmer is that. Uh, we want to allow programs to scale transparently. So here, the mantra size doesn't matter. That it doesn't really matter to the end user. That you know whether you're operating on on megabytes or terabytes. That it should be roughly the same computation. Um, and we want again for the end user, we want to abstract away all fault tolerance, synchronization, etc. And together, this really makes it um, um, very easy to to do fairly sophisticated computations without having to think too much about it. Um, and the last uh, last slide, if you haven't seen seen MapReduce, just to, to show you what you know um, how powerful this this framework is for for doing large scale computation. Um, this is this is a little bit of pseudocode, but it's basically the real deal. It doesn't matter what it what it actually says. The take home point is that this is ten lines of code, and I'm here. I'm computing the diffusion structure on on Twitter. So it's ten lines of code. It proceeds in ten MapReduce rounds, about a thousand compute nodes. And one hour of, of compute time, one hour of walk lock time, uh, we have the structure of, of diffusion on Twitter, right? So, so ten lines of code. It's very little. You know, you, you mean this is not this is not serious stuff here. And so, this is what I mean by trivial. Like, we're we're doing this massive, very sophisticated computation in theory, but we're just implementing it in this high level language. Um, and we don't have to worry about fault tolerance. Like during this one hour, a lot of these nodes will fail. And that's fine because it's invisible to the, to the end user. They fail, they recover, and at the end of the day, you get what you want. Um, OK, so now to the substance. What do we actually find after we do this, this computation? So this is, um, these are the top five cascade structures in all six of our domains. And um, so these are ordered by frequency. So the, you know, first, just looking at this, this looks nothing like that. Okay? So even without explaining exactly what you were looking at over there, this, you know, if this is if this is the view of diffusion, then we don't see trees like that showing up here. Like these are very different types of diffusion structures. So again, just to be clear what, what are we looking at? These um, at the top of these of each of these trees uh, is a seed. And then this is saying that this seed individual um, passed it on to this individual who adopted, and then this next, this individual passed it on to this other individual who adopted. And so these are, these, uh, each, each of these are the, the um, top five diffusion trees in each of the domains. And now looking at the numbers, well, there are two uh, salient points. The first is that in all the domains, the overwhelming majority of events is a trivial one, namely nothing happens. So an individual adopts this product, so about you know, roughly 90% of the time um, across domains, an individual will adopt a product, and that's it. We won't see anything else happen. Okay, so and first I should say, well, how are people actually adopting if it's not happening through diffusion? Well, all these are advertised. All these products are, or many of these advertised products are advertised. Twitter is a little bit different. Twitter, you can just, you can just um, uh, take a URL from somewhere and put it in your, in your. Uh, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, you kind of expect, I'm looking at zinc, uh -huh. that for the 22%, uh, you ought to see something like 22% squared for the, the next one. Oh, yeah, so this, not, so. Um, I mean, it's, it's actually not, it's not so bad. I mean, it's, it's not actually, yeah, it's not that bad. Um, so it's it's reasonable that you can say that the second person is almost independent of, you know, it's almost like this person with the seed. I mean, there is, th you're saying there is some dependency on whether or not this is coming from the seed or whether or not right. it's coming from, you know, someone who is one step away from the seed. Right. So and we do see some dependency, but it's not actually that bad. 
And similarly, there should be some relation between the, the fourth and the fifth factors in the fourth and the fifth these yeah um yeah yeah I and mean, so what we see is that it's you know it's not so bad to assume some sort of um you know branching process time model where it doesn't you know every individual has some distribution of number of people that they're gonna they're gonna spread to you know that's it's not exactly right as you point out but it's not actually awful um so i would say the two high level points are first again to reiterate nothing happens most of the time Okay, the second is, uh, oh, come back to second. The second is that when things do happen, almost all of it is happening at one level, at one degree out. So the vast majority of trees, you know, again, this is important and I'll come back to that in a minute. The vast majority of trees are of depth less than or equal to one. They're either depth zero or they're depth one, but almost nothing is happening at depth two or greater. Okay, is there a question? Oh, that's actually, yeah, what so this is just the percentage of trees. You could yeah. have some huge, massive tree, right? Exactly. So I'll come to this point in a second. Okay. So now, and to recap here, we have that the the mean tree depth is relatively small. Um, between eighty four and ninety four percent of trees have no children. Uh, between ninety six and ninety nine percent of trees die out within one generation. Again, these are cross domains. That's what the the intervals are. But now, the very natural natural question is that you know this might not even be that surprising because we Imagine all these distributions are, are heavy-tailed, um, right-skewed. So most of the time, the trees are, are going to be these trivial events that nothing happens. And then, you know, sometime we might see this huge, massive, gigantic tree. In fact, all the adopters live in that, that big tree. And that would be completely consistent with everything I've, I've shown you so far. But then, you know, then you, in, in that case, you would say all the important stuff still conforms to our view of multi-step diffusion. Right, so is this point, is this distinction clear that, that I've been conditioning on trees, but really the, the pertinent question is, is one of where you condition on adopters. Where do most adopters live? Right? Is this picture uh, representative of, of adopters? Or is it only representative of trees? And what we find um, is that in fact, between 94 and 99% of adopters are within one generation of a seed. And so this is saying that this picture is really a strong approximation to the structure of diffusion, right? That I can pick, you know, most, most of the adopters. I'm not really missing any action when I show you this picture. In, in terms of trees, it's clear, but even in terms of adoption, adoptions, and mostly I get this, and then there's some big stuff happening, but it's either, you know, it's, it's either relatively rare or it's relatively small that that accounts for a small fraction of, of total adoption. Mm -hmm. So the domains are quite different. So the secretary game is an identical game that their people are passing on, right? It's like, I encountered this, I want to tell my friends. Yep. And maybe they'll pick it up or maybe not. Yep. In Yahoo Kindness, I guess it's the same thing. In Zinc, it's whatever <coughs> video I decided interests me. Uh, actually, Zinc, what we're here we're talking um, about adoption of the application oh, okay. itself. Oh, okay. So, so there's not some, it's not something here like content which some of the content, you know, might spread like this, and then if some, the difference in product, there's no difference in product, is what I'm, is, is so, so there are many starting seeds, but, you know, yeah. whereas, whereas you could think of a model where if the product is really amazing, and I was the first to discover it, or, you know, a small group discovered it, and they said, oh, this is really amazing, and then they were right, and the fact was a lot of people, like, maybe that, will, you, you might say, you know, if your product is really good, then this, is, doesn't interest you. Uh, maybe this is not a good example of how it will spread. Is that, can you say yeah. So okay. So a couple comments. First, you you do have to worry about uh, drifting towards tautology by saying that it's you know it's 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 bad unless it's viral, right? right? Yeah. And so how many right. ever examples you look at, you can you know presumably and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk that I do think there are really viral examples mm -hmm. out there, and you don't want to be in the situation where you say that. Nothing is interesting except for those examples because you really haven't learned anything about the world then, right? And so the, the, the important question is what is the distribution of these events? Or you know, a more refined version of that is you know, what is the conditional distribution given all these features, right? You know, if I tell you about you know, all of these characteristics of this product, you know, what can I tell you about the likelihood that it's going to 
you know, diffuse virally? That's really the question that we're ultimately after. And here, this is a relatively limited um, set of examples. I mean, there are five real conventional products, and then Twitter is sort of 100 million somethings. I mean, it's, they're not, they're, I'm using them as products, but they're, they're not really products in the same sense as these other examples. And even if it were the case that 10% you know, of products um, were to become viral, we could reasonably miss it here. Okay, so this is something that I think is uh, is is uh, is a serious objection, and uh, really, you know, another way to to say this is that what if all the products we study are just crappy, right? And that's what it amounts to. You know, we're not seeing viral diffusion because they, you know, they're just bad, and you don't expect bad things to be viral. Now, I will say that. In fact, all of the examples that I put up, they were designed, some by us, some by marketers, to be viral. We were trying to promote diffusion. And so you know, that could say something about the fact that we don't know what we're doing. Um, but at least the intent was to make them viral. And that's not super satisfying. So a slightly more satisfying answer is this. That so let's look at the 100,000 Twitter links that were independently introduced by at least 10 people. Right, so we started out with something like 100 million likes. And now we, we don't really know what it means to be good, but we're going to use as a proxy that a lot of people independently introduce this thing. Okay? So this is, this is a pretty small selection. Right? This, we're, now we're talking about you know, one in every thousand URLs, so hopefully we've filtered away all of the junk. And these are things that people have, have repeatedly introduced. And now for each of these things, we're going to say viral, again to give a very conservative definition, we're going to say that that we're going to quantify viral by the percentage of adopters that are far from a seed. And far, we just mean at least two generations away. So we're not going to call this particular product, this URL, viral if, mm, if a lot of the adopters are either you know, the initial seed or just people that are one step away. But you know, if a lot of adopters are far from the seed, then we're going to characterize this as viral. So just a just simple binary classification. And again, we're, we're looking at things which we think are inherently good by you know, some crowdsourced measure. Um, and what do we find? Well, we find that only 1% of URLs have at least half their adopters far from a seed. And half, again, this is not really, I, I would say this is not really viral if you know, you're saying half, another way of saying this is that half of the adopters are close to the seed, either the seed or within one generation. So that's not particularly viral. So maybe we care something like 90% of adopters are, are far from a seed. And here we have about 1 in 10,000. Okay, so this stretches the limit of where we can estimate because we only started with 100,000, right? And so roughly we only see a handful of examples in all of, in all of this data where, where I would say they're, they're viral by this definition. Now I'm going to come back and show you that in fact this is, the bad, this is the bad definition of viral, but it's certainly one that I would say is necessary. You know, it's not sufficient, but if, if most of the adopters are close to the seed, then it's probably not viral. But you can have examples where a lot of adopters are far from the seed, and it's still not. Well, so I'll show you that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, what's the conversion of 90% of the adopters far from the seed into something like an exponential growth parameter? Um, is there? I guess you don't know because you don't know the diameter. There, there, there isn't, and so in, 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 yeah. uh, uh, in fact, I'll I'll show you an example that there could be no exponential growth at all, and you could have this. You can have this true, you just have broadcast. And so you don't have this. You could have this fact and, or you and have no. Perpetual linear growth. Or you could have, yeah. Okay, yeah. You it. I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell you, right. tell you anything. Um, that's actually an interesting case because there, there is, that example exists as well for some reason that I don't understand how you can have. Basically, you've, you have linear growth for right. over 10 years. Later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's somewhat bizarre because it, it seems extremely unstable that type of growth, um, but it, it does exist. OK, so, um, so now these results suggest that going viral, even by relatively conservative measures, is rare. Uh, but what about the rare large events? Are those viral? So we can ask just you know, from a purely scientific point of view, it's like you, even if we accept the fact that the distribution is such that we don't see large events most of the time, well, you know, in this tale, in the, among these large events, do they conform to the usual definition of multi-step viral diffusion, or is there some other other process happening here? And we find is they don't, in fact, look at all like um, viral diffusion. So even the largest events that we look at, they are m like broadcast. So what's happening here? Well, these are the top four um, uh, diffusion events that we see in our in our data. Uh, 
and uh, so this is this is the seed, the big green node in all of these, and now they're color coded by um, generation. So what happened here is that this seed broadcast to or, or sent out to you know ten other people who adopted in the yellow, and then this yellow node right here broadcast to about twenty thousand nodes. Okay, so first thing to notice is that that this is actually viral by that conservative definition, right? Because all of the action is happening in the second generation. Okay, so this, but this is clearly not viral in our conventional terminology. It's not peer-to-peer -peer diffusion. Um, uh, so we, we, we really were playing it conservative with that other measure. Um, and we see this again happening here. It starts here, goes out to three nodes, and then this one node broadcasts it out to, I think, 60,000 in this case. Um, and here is slightly different. Um, we have a few different broadcast nodes. Um, we have this one here and, and this one here. But again, a handful of nodes are directly responsible for um, most adoptions. So this is a very different um, picture than what you what you might expect if you if you were to take this uh, contagious biological contagion view of the world. So even conditioning on the largest events, what we see is very different than. Um, than what you expect given that you know, that type of um, worldview. Okay, so now um, you know, wh what we've established so far is that the structured diffusion networks is consistent across the six domains that we study, despite substantial differences in the product being diffused. For example, URLs or retweeting URLs, which is basically costless, um, all the way to a, a, a relatively expensive PC to phone service. You have to pull out your credit card. You have to pay real money to use this thing. Um, the population of adopters, uh, the meaning of adoption, retweeting, buying a service, the way in which we detect and infer peer-to-peer -peer transmission, we really see the exact same picture across all of these domains. But now there's still this uh, remaining parameter that we haven't investigated, and uh, it, could, uh, it could really, um, in theory, change the results that we, that we find. Right? So what is this, what is this missing um, parameter? Uh, what it means to adopt within a domain. So here, uh, imagine that you know, in, in all these things, the, the denominator uh, is, 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 is there's a population in question that we're averaging over are all people who adopted this product, right? And so what if, you, what if it's the case that most people like, are happy to try this product, but they don't really have any intention of sharing it, right? And so now this would artificially deflate your estimate of what these, you know, what diffusion looks like, because is it really fair to count as your population, all the people who just um, uh, tried out zinc once and then they just walked away and they really don't have any intention of ever using this thing again, right? Is it, is it, that might not really be the fair population to consider. So maybe it's better uh, you know, to capture the, the real adopters, the people who have consistently used this product you know, over a period of time, several times, and then these are the people who really like the product and they're the ones who we uh, believe will actually diffuse this thing and now let's look you know conditional on, on that level of adoption you know what what type of structure do we see and why condition binary why not condition level of use so that, that is what we're actually going to do um, and what we find is nothing changes and this is something that's a little bit surprising to me so uh, in three of the uh, uh, in three of the examples this Facebook game the secretary game and zinc, what we have is uh, the number of times that people use this, uh, 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 use this product. So this is the activity threshold on the x-axis. So here, for example, um, well, I'll use example, for instance, this is a game that, that I built on Facebook. Um, and you know, it's a, I, mean, I thought it was kind of a fun game, but to play it 50 or 100 times, even I don't think I played it that many times. So these are pretty serious uh, pretty serious users, and the size of the circle indicates the percentage of, of total adopters that are in here. And so we're down to about you know one percent uh, to five percent up here of people in these extreme bins. So this is a really a small subset of the population. And now on the y-axis we have the mean tree size. So if we vary this, we use this level of uh, of adoption as, as qualifying for being a real adopter. Uh, we don't see any difference in the average tree size. And so our findings, and, and I, I could have ch shown you different statistics, this is just something to, that's easy to interpret. Um, and also to point out, before what we were using is an activity threshold of one, right? So using this product at all, 
qualified as being an adopter, and uh, and really we don't see you know we see, see small changes, but really it's it's remarkably flat. Uh, so we don't see qualitative differences by varying this this um, definition of adoption. Um, and this is something that I I I don't um, don't really have good intuition about the other results. Uh, I already entered into this project thinking, oh, well, even though there's this hype about diffusion, you know, just from basic economic arguments of you know, finite attention and, 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 and these sorts of things, that you wouldn't expect it to be particularly easy to get things to diffuse. Um, this is something where I was a little bit surprised. It's, it's not clear to me what's, you know, what is causing this. Is it that there are two factors that are just canceling each other out? Because presumably, you know, these people really do like the product more, and you know they're you know presumably they're sharing it more, right? So, what you know what is happening? Are they only sharing it with people who also like this product more? I mean, it's it's. They probably don't have that many friends who really like the product because they're they're only one percent of the. Right yeah, so it's. Uh, how, what's the chances that they have enough friends to it. Yeah, I mean, it's heavy doctors don't have friends. Oh yeah, <laughs> that that's also <laughs> reasonable, right? They're less social. <laughs> um, you know, it's I don't really understand who these people are. So <laughs> it's, those mega diffusers, you know, in the earlier ones where you showed these. Oh, uh, they were news organizations. Uh, they're, so they're not real people. No, 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 no. They're you don't you can't diffuse to sixty thousand people if you're a. I mean, even if you are a real person, you're not a, a real person. <laughs> you're not one of us. <laughs> this is, yeah, yeah. Uh, for some products, right, I mean, people actually, if someone tells me about something, let's say some video or something, I don't actually follow a link. I may search for it, right? So this, won't miss this kind of stuff. Uh, that's true. I think it's, um, it would be pretty surprising if that's what's happening here, that, uh, that all of the diffusion is occurring off network. Uh, because that's essentially the type of argument that you're making, that the diffusion is occurring off the networks that we measure um, for a few different reasons. Well, in three of the domains, that's almost impossible to happen because however you share this link, unless you like go in and try to extract out the code that we're using to make this thing unique, um, we would see it over whatever channel you, you distribute this. Unless you're going to say, go to secretarygame.com or whatever. It actually had a right, less... You for it, right? you go to Google. Uh, and this, for it. it would be hard to search for. It's not, it's not that popular. Um, so uh, that's that's possible, but I think unlikely. And also in Twitter, again, you're posting this URL. You could, in theory, tell somebody about this URL. They post it, um, but it seems much more likely that most of the diffusion will be occurring by retweeting. Uh, I I think the opposite problem, in fact, occurs that some of what we infer as being diffusion is, in fact, just homophily that people independently adopt this product, particularly in the case of Facebook, that people independently uh, start playing this game. And we attribute all of that adoption to the first person in the network who adopted this game. Right, so I, I think if anything, we're overestimating the diffusion, not underestimating it. Um, OK, so in, in conclusion, in, uh, uh, say that all the examples we study, we find that multi-step diffusion is the exception rather than the rule. And the vast majority of adoptions occur within one step of a seed. So this observation appears pretty robust, holding across many different domains and adoption thresholds. But at this point, I, you know, you probably have this nagging feeling, at least I have this, this nagging feeling, that, that what about all the products that we know went viral? For example, YouTube hits and Hotmail, these are canonical examples. Facebook is another, another example. Angry Birds. Angry Birds. Um, I mean, there there are lots of examples that we can you know we think of that we we know those went viral. So you know how do how do you reconcile that feeling with the empirical results that I've I've shared so far? Um, so here I think there are at least three possible explanations. I mean, the first is that that the things that we think went viral really weren't viral at all in this in this sense that I'm talking about it. That, that it's not that they're popular, right? I don't want to conflate popular with viral, and this is something that's you know, the news media are consistently do this, right? Just because a YouTube video is popular doesn't mean that it was, that it became popular by diffusing through some, um, through some social network. You know, it could have been broadcast by some of these hubs, and that's exactly what we see for the most popular piece of content that, that, that we observe, that they weren't viral at all, but they were really a product of, of uh, broadcast notes. 
Um, the second is that viral products have a key feature that's lacking in the domains that we investigate. Right? So here there's some secret sauce. Right? There's some viralness. And that's, um, you know, in, even though we've, we've studied a variety of domains, that we, just, we might be missing something. You know, there's, there's just some, you know, some class of domains that's not represented in the, in the examples we study. And in that class of domains, everything goes viral all the time. You know, that's possible. And in fact, like that's what happens in this, this class of examples, that here everything goes viral all the time. So what is this? This is um, uh, respondent driven sampling. So uh, this is probably an unfamiliar um, uh, uh, sampling study or sampling design. Uh, so th the, but the way it works is very simple. It's, it's a modification of snowball sampling, where the, the idea is you want to uh, you want to survey some hard to reach population like drug injectors. You know, ordinarily what you do, you flip open the phone book, you pick out random people, you random to style, something like that. But there's no list of drug injectors. And if you were to do this randomly, you know, drug injectors make up a relatively small percentage of the population. So it'd be pretty expensive to randomly stumble upon someone in this population. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you find a few of these people in this population you know, by going to the park or, you know, however means you spend, you know, this relatively expensive upfront cost to find a few people in the population. But then at that point, you get them, the people in that population to recruit others in the population. And then you get those people to recruit other people in the population, then it's so on and so on. You know, so you get everybody to recruit people who they presumably know in the subpopulation into the study. Okay, so why do people do this? Um, well, the answer is money. So you pay people participate in the study and you also pay people to recruit people into the study. So when you have this type of financial compensation, what we see is viral diffusion every time. And in fact, like I indicated before, this was intentionally terminated after a few steps um, because the study uh, organizers ran out of money. They have a certain amount of budget. They're looking to get you know, 500, 1,000 people. And then after they reach that target, they just shut it down. And this is exactly what happens every time. So people respond to money. And that is, you know, that's not particularly surprising, but it, it does show a couple things. I mean, first, there's nothing in theory that is, uh, uh, that's prohibiting viral diffusion. You know, it's not something about social networks. Or in, in, so this is, or it's, there's not some like measurement error that we can, in fact, detect viral, situ viral diffusion in some situations. And it turns out here that it's probably the uninteresting case from the perspective of marketers. Yes? What about something like Occupy Wall Street? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's that being spread by the mainstream media at, at the very minimum. It mm -hmm. it's takes up one third of every news broadcast that, yeah. that I see. But it's also true that they are recruiting others uh, and proselyting and they're having these yeah, and I, my, my conjecture, I mean, I, I went down to um, Occupy Wall Street with uh, a couple of friends, and, and we didn't know anyone there. And my guess is most people who have participated in those protests were not recruited by other people. You know, these are independent seeds who they hear about. I mean, it, it really is occupying a huge share of the news right now. Right, front line. You, know, you really can't ask for better it's advertising. It's also moving to other cities. You know, yeah. Globally, internationally. Yeah. But I mean, this is it's you know you it, no advertiser has has better coverage than this. This is front page of the New York Times. You know, not every day, but many days. Um, and it's really you know it's on the news feed. It's all it's all over the place. So this is really this effect of of popular is not um, not the same as peer to peer diffusion. Mm -hmm. I think you might be able to like, look at how to diffuse on uh, Twitter when it first started. Because I know the Occupy Wall Street hashtag really kind of started a lot of the initial stuff because it was all the guys with like the the, the beaver vendetta masks, like the first ones there, and they got nothing but Twitter diffusion. Mm -hmm. So you can even look at it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I As a second generation note. Well, I was like the original diffusers. They were the guys who originally started it. Uh, yeah, it's. I guess this comes back to the um, the last point. I mean, my my feeling is that Occupy Wall Street is not really um, is is not actually viral because even early on, things like um, 
uh, Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman, you know, national broadcast, national television broadcast, and national radio was covering this. And so that's huge advertising, right? So it's, I mean, New York Times was relatively late to pick up on this stuff, or at least relatively late to put it on the, on the front page or to add any legitimacy toward the, toward the movement. But still, there was a lot of media attention, um, you know, compared to, so it's, it's not the case that there are, there are a handful of individuals and the only way to find out about this was knowing one of them or knowing one of their friends. It, that there are many ways to find out about, about this type of thing happening. But with that being said, I do believe that there are, uh, are actual viral events occurring out there. And uh, you know, I think Facebook might be such an example that its growth, you know, it, was, it was started in this closed network and it's possible that that really spread word of mouth. Um, you know, I don't, after the fact, it's it's hard to say definitively, but you know, if it's not Facebook, I'm sure there are other examples out there. Um, and those rare events could be precisely the ones suggested by our data. And really, the next question is uh, is trying to understand the tail of the distribution. So in this talk, I've I've discussed the head of the distribution, and. Uh, what I think is that, that this view of the head is quite different than the conventional wisdom, but certainly we haven't been able to look at the tail yet, and this is something that we're actively working on. Um, uh, uh, you know, we're down to a resolution of about 1 in 10,000, and there we don't really see things going viral, but almost certainly once you get down to 100, 1 in 100,000, 1 in a million, we really are going to see um, viral diffusion occurring. So that's the real question. What is the structure of the, of the tail of this distribution? Um, so now, a couple of take-home points. For uh, theorists, I would say, to, you know, despite the fact that, that hundreds of papers have been, been written with the implicit assumption that, uh, that diffusion of, uh, of products, of ideas, is akin to diffusion of biological contagion. You know, this is what's implicit in the threshold model or the cascade model. Um, I, I think this viewpoint is, is probably not uh, an accurate one of, of the way the world wor works. You know, even the word viral is, of, of, of course, um, uh, uh, referring to biological contagion. And although this is, you know, in, in theory, this could have been the case that, that the diffusion of products and ideas is, is, in fact, quite similar to a biological contagion, uh, in practice, I think it's not. And so this is, this is an important distinction to make. Um, the uh, uh, the second, this is slightly more uh, controversial point, is that that I would even go as far as saying that network structure is probably not key to understanding diffusion. And here, what I mean by that is that I think a local network structure is important. Um, you know, number of friends you have, things like that. That's that's important. But you know, complicated network structure is probably not key. And why is that? Because what we see is almost everything is happening at the local level. So these are really independent pockets of, of local local bursts of adoptions. And if you believe that this is uh, really a, a general phenomenon, uh, then you don't need to understand the complicated structure of the network. And so to give one example of this, there's um, the, the influence maximization problem, which was popularized by um, uh, Kempe Kleinberg and Tardosh. You know, this is saying that you have this, uh, uh, you have some, uh, 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 threshold model or cascade model of diffusion, and, and now your objective is to pick some set of seeds uh, to maximize the expected amount of adoption in the network. And if you really take this view of just local, local bursts, and that's it, then this problem becomes trivial. Right? You don't need to understand the complicated structure of the actual network. You just have to pick like high degree nodes, something like that, and just do this independently. Um, and, and so this is, uh, I would say this, uh, uh, this fact is, or this assumption is implicit in almost all of the theoretical work on diffusion. And my guess is that, that in fact, in many practical cases, these are local effects. So you don't need to understand, you don't need to understand the complicated global network structure. And that makes life a lot easier on one hand. You don't, you know, it's, it's very, very hard to do this global optimization. It's pretty easy to do a local local optimization. Um, so for marketers, uh, in here I'm marketers in this in this general sense of anyone who wants to uh, diffuse information. These could be educators or policymakers who want to get some idea out there. Um, well, the viral boost is is smaller than generally believed, so plan accordingly. Um, 
this might be the, the, the harsh reality version of it, that you know, if, you're, if your business plan is predicated on uh, a thousand-fold growth by finding a couple key players, you know, that's probably not going to be the case, or that's, that's a big gamble to make. Um, in in uh, slightly uh, uh, more optimistic or more useful maybe way of saying this is that focus on taking mean tree size from 1.2 to 1.4. Right, so w after we throw away this this viewpoint that we're going to be able to start with a handful of people and then get a thousand-fold growth, well, you know, if that's not true, there is still something that we can do. That let's say we have this twenty percent growth. Well, if we if we add social sharing features, if we set up a Facebook page, set up a Twitter account, all these things, maybe we can bump that up. You know, instead of twenty percent viral uh, boost to like thirty percent or forty percent viral boost, and I, I think that's very uh, realistic to move from this kind of default region of doing nothing and getting something for free, this 20%, to doing something, you know, something relatively minor, and getting a little bit more for free. And in traditional terms, this is, and this is huge, right? If I can say that just, just do these relatively simple optimizations, and all of a sudden you can, you know, get like 20%, 30% more, um, more people than you could have otherwise, that's, that's pretty big. You know, it's not big if you live in the world of hush puppies and you are looking for these, you know, thousand-fold increases. And, you know, that's not really consoling. But in, certainly if you don't come in with this, with this prior of, of winning the lottery every time, then going from 1.2 to 1.4, I think, is both attainable um, and should be, uh, you know, lucrative. So it's, it's, I, th I think it's something to focus on. Okay, um, so I am not going to get to the second part of the talk. But I will. Oh, but show us the best graph. <laughs> best graph. There's something there. Uh, <laughs> there is, there is, um, oh, well, I'll, I'll jump to the punchline of the, uh, of the talk, um, of the second part. So the second part of the talk was, actually, this is what Bo was talking about, maybe, which I, I heard recent Bo Pang. Did she, did she give this talk about the long tail? work. She mentioned it, didn't really it, she didn't get through too. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. So, so, so I, 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 yeah, I will, I'll give you the, it's always the teaser. I'll give you the, um, the one minute setup and the 30 second conclusion. So the, uh, the, the setup is that we now have access to these so-called infinite inventory retailers like Netflix, iTunes, uh, Amazon, where we can pretty much get anything we want. Um, it's, it's just available for us. And with Chris Anderson, he made this observation, um, or at least it's attributed to him, that, that this market for the worst sellers is relatively large. That uh, uh, if you look at all of the, the worst selling books, the worst selling movies, the worst selling songs, that that accounts for a sizable fraction of total sales, so around a third, just to give you a, a rough number of things that you would certainly not call um, um, things that, that were successes. Uh, so, so this, so using this fact, he makes the argument that you shouldn't neglect the the tail because you know assuming relatively low inventory costs, which seems to be the case at least for digital distribution, um, uh, then you're you're losing out a big chunk of this market. So now, what we're asking is a, is a different version of this question. Uh, do you, is, is it the case that all this tail consumption, this large tail consumption, is it, is it being driven by a relatively small group of, of eccentrics? Or is it being driven you know, in aggregate by a lot of different people? And why does this matter? Well, in the first case, if it's a relatively small group of eccentrics, if you decide not to carry all of this niche inventory, then what's going to happen is you're probably going to uh, annoy all these eccentrics and they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else. Okay. Now, what if you, uh, what if it's this, this second view of the world where everyone is occasionally looking at this, at this, this tail content? If I get rid of all this tail content, then I potentially could annoy everybody, all of my customers, because some percentage of the time they're not going to be able to find what they're looking for, so they might go somewhere else. So, in the second view of the world, in fact, not carrying this tail content could have serious repercussions because of these second-order effects that I'm just generally dissatisfied because most people see this change in the, in, in, the, in the type of inventory that I'm carrying. And now, now that I'm generally dissatisfied, I, in fact, lose all of my customers. So they could lead to very different outcomes. If you're the first to cut the tail. Yeah, assuming they can go somewhere, somewhere else and find these things. Okay. Um, yeah, if nobody has the tail, then it's moot point because 
you know, you're just stuck. Uh, so what we find is, uh, is across a variety of domains. So we look at um, movies, music, uh, web search, web browsing, a bunch of different domains. We find that uh, substantial fraction of users regularly consume niche content. So this is not the Britney Spears avatar view of the world, where most people are just viewing these popular things and then they don't really care about foreign films. They don't care about any of these other things. It seems like everybody cares about the uh, niche content. Niche means something different to each of these people, um, but everybody cares about all this, you know, this this weird content at least some of the time. That's about one third, you were saying, very roughly. Is that what? No, here, every, uh, no, everyone here is like ninety percent. Substantial fraction. So substantial is like ninety percent. Ninety percent. Yeah. So almost everyone is uh, at least occasionally consuming niche content. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's an interesting, uh, literally hardware analogy to this. Uh, it used to be that there were many small hardware stores which were just packed with things. They would have every size of bulk, mm -hmm. just yeah. in case someone came in. Uh, they mostly got annihilated by places like Home Depot and Lowe's, uh, which greatly restricted the range that was available. Home Depot now has racks of shelves with every size of screw in it. So it could be that in out there in real world goods, people are discovering the same thing. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think that's true. I mean, this is also, you know, it's, it's funny, but it's similar to the Walmart strategy that they want to be this one-stop shop by saying now they, you know, I guess it's been a long time now, but they have groceries at, at Walmart, right? So you just go there, you get everything you want. You don't have to go to multiple stores. You just go to one place, and this is certainly Amazon's strategy. They carry everything. And so you go to this one place, and you get everything you want, and then why go anywhere else? Um, so uh, in this, in these empirical findings suggest that the benefit of tail and extends beyond direct revenue to the second order gains um, associated with increased consumer satisfaction, repeat patronage. And so here's a high level take home point is that when deciding whether or not to stock the latest worst sellers, the pertinent question is not how many copies will I sell. I mean, this is the first order question. Right, that I think a lot of people ask, how many copies will I sell if I carry this product? But, but rather, how many customers will I gain? Right, so if I stock this, how many people will I just gain their business by virtue of, of carrying this you know, obscure bolt? Mm -hmm. would, it, would it be correct to say that this analysis also supports the position that uh, uh, expectations uh, that the internet will be a democratizing force are overblown? Um, so, so why do you, so, so maybe I don't quite understand the, the um, question. I'm kind of looking at it from the other side in a way. So if, if, if it's, it's really when it comes to viral things that are happening, the diffusion, it's all the news organizations and some of the big players, so to yeah. speak, and then the Home Depot, as Paul mentioned, same, similar idea, the big yeah. players control the diffusion. The internet then, one or two people are going to talk, but it's not going to go far in the majority of cases, so. So I, I think that is true. And so this, um, actually both parts of the talk are related to this point. So one, um, uh, uh, to give you one, one concrete example of this, uh, that uh, Google was in an uh, antitrust suit in the EU, and they were making the argument that, um, you know, the antitrust is because they were, uh, th they were saying that, it, that it's, it's relatively easy for people to enter the search business. And that's, that's true, in fact, that it's not, um, it's not hard to set up a crawler that will give you reasonable results. It's, it's hopelessly not true. It, well, I th I, I'll come back to why it's not, why it's <laughs> not, not true. But it, the, the, it's, it, you know, I'm not saying that you can set this up in your garage, but you know, $10 million will go a long ways, and you can, um, I mean, so in that sense, it's, it's competitive business that, you know, relatively small amount of, of capital can get you set up with a crawler and get you set up. It's not going to be terribly yeah. difficult to find. Yeah. I remember years ago when Yahoo was just starting its own crawler. Yeah. Hearing Ryan Ramey Stata, he's now at Google, say that it took 50 people to do a crawler. It took fit five to write the crawler, and it took 45 to fend off the spammers as best possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
That's 50 people is not a huge. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not a huge uh, amount of. of ratio. And His comment was 10. Years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so so it's I think it's it is accurate that really and you, you do occasionally see these these um, search companies pop up, um, and uh, it's relatively easy uh, IR problem to to extract the top results for any you know for a lot of these popular queries, right? If you were to you know just look for you know president of the U.S., you'd really have to be doing something dumb to not return the top results for that that type of query. Um, but the problem is that it's extremely difficult to do well in the tail, right? It's a difficult enough problem that even Microsoft, with you know huge amounts of money invested in the search engine, it finds it difficult to compete with Google. And the point of this analysis is that if you can't compete in the tail, then that is really you know tantamount to not being able to compete in the head, right? So it's re it's true that it's relatively easy to set up a search engine that's competitive in the head. But it's extremely difficult to set up an engine which is competitive in the tail. And if you believe this, that if you can't compete in the tail, and since switching costs are so low, why is a consumer going to, you know, go to this startup company that is good 90% of the time, or even 95% of the time, but 5% of the time they give you ridiculous results? You know, I have no incentive to actually use that. I mean, I'm just going to keep on using what I'm, you know, what gives me results, good results, almost all the time. You know, in that sense, it's very, very hard to compete with Google. And so the uh, um, and so this is that we used this type of analysis to argue argue that point. Um, uh, okay. So now the caveat with all this uh, is that uh, I I think that all else equal, carrying tail inventory has not only this first order effect but also the second order effect. Um, but that being said, in the real world, we never have all else equal. And one good example of this is, is Redbox. This is one of a handful of DVD vending companies that rents movies via kiosks that they typically offer a couple hundred titles, the most popular titles, and they're outside of like McDonald's and Walmart and all these things. Um, so this is extreme head strategy. Right? And so Netflix has something like 100,000 movies. This is a couple hundred movies. So this is extreme head of the distribution. But in aggregate, these DVD renting companies control about 20% of the DVD rental market. So very, very successful um, in getting market share with this extreme head uh, strategy. So this is just to say that, that, uh, that the, you know, looking at the tail, um, I think it's important, but there are a variety of other factors. And so it's, it's not necessarily a, you know, the key to success. There are lots of Lots of possible avenues. Um, so just an overall summary of this talk. The uh, increasing availability of social and behavioral data, um, together with rapidly maturing tools for large-scale data analysis, led to the emergence of this, this field of computational social science. And we're really, um, as I hopefully I've convinced you in this talk, we're able to identify and measure patterns of human behavior that were, that were difficult, and I would say even prohibitively difficult only a short while ago. Um, and aside from scientific understanding, these microscopes into society will likely have considerable impact on real world problems, um, ranging from managerial decisions to public health. Um, so final, final slide. Uh, if the, uh, some of these things, they're blog post versions and papers on, on my website, Messy Matters, and attention students and postdocs we're hiring, so please shoot me an email if you're, if you're interested in any of these types of problems. Thanks.